Hello, having looked at input and output hardware, now time to spend a few videos talking about storage. Now, storage and memory, and helpfully in computing, is really wishy-washy, and the terminology varies quite a bit. We're going to focus on RAM and ROM. Now, RAM and ROM can be called primary storage. They also can be called main memory, and arguably they are both examples of memory. Now, the distinction between primary storage and secondary storage, which we'll look at in the next video, is that primary storage is memory which is directly connected to the CPU. Secondary storage isn't connected in the sense the CPU is able to execute stuff from it, it has to get copied to primary storage in order for it to be executed. Now, like I say, memory, storage, primary storage, main memory, all a little bit wishy-washy, unfortunately, not something to worry too much about. Typically, the word memory implies something quite short-term. So cache is quite short-term, registers are quite short term and RAM is quite short term. Typically the word storage implies longer term. We're thinking more like hard drives and SSDs, which we'll come on to look at. But if you're wanting a really, really tight distinction between storage and memory, you're not going to get it, unfortunately. Now we need to have some storage, some memory. So if we can run different programs, if we had no memory, our CPU would have to be hard coded to run a particular program. Us having memory, means we can load in multiple programs and the CPU can take turns executing these different programs. First ever computers could only ever execute one program. It was only when they added memory that you could suddenly start to switch between different programs. Now, like I've said, primary storage typically consists of both RAM and ROM, which are two different components. RAM we've talked about because it's, it's what the CPU interacts with most often. RAM stands for random access memory. In a desktop PC, it looks like this. We've got two sticks of RAM here, which slot into the motherboard. Now, the purpose of RAM is to hold programs and data that are currently in use, or at least are currently open. Now, don't forget that a program is just a set of instructions. So both instructions and data are held in RAM. If it's von Neumann, it's one stick of RAM. If it is Harvard, they are split across two different sticks of RAM. Now these programs and most data will be sat on secondary storage permanently, but when we want to open it, we need to copy it from secondary storage into RAM because the CPU can't access something which is in secondary storage. It has to get copied into RAM to be accessible. Now a really important property of RAM is that it is volatile. Volatile memory loses data when power is turned off. And this is why if you don't save your work and your computer switches off or you get a power cut, you might lose some of your work. Now our three fastest memories in a computer are registers, cache, and RAM. All three are volatile. So to make memory really fast, as part of its design, it almost needs to be volatile. So you could argue it's a trade-off between being volatile, which is not necessarily a good thing, versus speed. In terms of the acronym itself, not the most helpful acronym in describing what it is, but random access refers to the fact that I can access items from any point, as in a random point on the RAM, and it should take exactly the same amount of time to access it. There is equal speed across all parts of this memory. Now this fact is important to store away, ironically, because this explains why in paper two, the big annotation for indexing an array is constant time. Now ROM, on the other hand, is a very, very underrated component. It is just a very nondescript memory chip, usually embedded into our motherboard. Now, ROM stands for read-only memory, which does tell us more about ROM because ROM cannot be easily changed by the user. We can read from it, no problem, read-only, but writing to it is used to be impossible. Nowadays, it's just quite tricky. So this is a slightly more subtle way of saying this because modern ROM is typically flash storage, which could be changed. It's just hard to do so. But the key fact about ROM is it's non-volatile. So when power turns off, data is kept. And it's essential for ROM to be non-volatile because all it really holds is the BIOS. Now, the BIOS is the first program to run when the computer is switched on. So the first thing you see when you turn a computer on is typically a screen like this. It'll be looking different depending on what motherboard company you've got. It'll be a flash of a black screen with usually white text. And then it will kick in to your operating system loading. And it's that first screen which is the BIOS running. So we'll come back to that in a second. Just a few other things to say is that because the BIOS is needed to start up our computer, this is why ROM needs to be non-volatile. 
If ROM was volatile, this would be lost when power is turned off. And if we need this to start our computer, then we are screwed because we've got no way of starting it unless we can run the BIOS. So ROM is only ever used right at the start. Once we kick into our OS loading, that is when RAM is used from now on. And that's why ROM is typically very small, maybe only a few megabytes, whereas RAM, because it's used for most of our work, is usually multiple gigabytes. So what does BIOS actually do? You might be eagle-eyed and notice this is actually in the next topic in the specification, but I think it's worth covering now because it's not, not a massive thing to have to understand. Well, it's another acronym. I'm afraid lots of acronyms today. BIOS stands for Basic Input Output System. And BIOS has got three main jobs, which it does. So this first program which runs begins with a power on self-test. This is where it goes through the main components and checks they are working as expected. It checks that they are sending signals to it. It checks that they're working at the correct frequency. So key components are things like the RAM or the CPU or the power supply. And it will alert the user to faults at this point, either on screen or by making noises. So I'm sure you've heard beeping. The computer makes when it first turns on. Often a single beep is a good sign, whereas something like this is a bad sign. And the benefit of it beeping to you is that if your graphics card is not working, for example, you might not see anything on screen. So you hearing those beeps means that you know there is an error. And you can Google what does four beeps in a row mean, and it will tell you, oh, your graphics card is not powered on properly, or you're missing a fan or something like that. And if you've ever built a computer, you will know this is really valuable because often you put parts together, you try and turn it on, and it's not working. And you've got no information as to why it's not working unless you could hear these beeps and you can see the results from this post operation. Now BIOS nowadays also allows you to configure quite a scary amount of stuff relating to your computer. Here's a screenshot of quite a high-end motherboard. So you can change basic things like where to boot from. All that means is what storage device are you booting from? Often you'll have multiple storage devices, maybe a primary one for your operating system and a slower one for all of your files. You can choose which one to, to boot from. You can also change things like the clock speed of your CPU via the BIOS. And this is evidence of a ROM not being totally read-only anymore, because if I'm changing my clock speed, the new value is being saved somewhere. It's being saved somewhere in ROM. So therefore ROM can be written to, it's just not easy. But these are kind of two secondary jobs, which are just helpful. One which is absolutely essential for BIOS to do. And the whole reason we have ROM in our computer is to boot up our operating system. Booting up refers to just starting up. And in the case of the OS, what this means is the OS is currently sat in secondary storage. The OS can't be in RAM because RAM gets wiped when power is turned off. So the OS is sat in secondary storage. It needs to get loaded into RAM so that we can use it properly. So the BIOS will copy the most essential part of the OS from secondary storage into RAM. So that after this point, the BIOS can stop working and the OS will take over. So after this point, the CPU no longer looks in ROM, it looks in RAM, and the OS will take over and continue any further loading which needs to be done. So the second you see the Windows logo or the Apple logo, that is proof that the BIOS is finished and it's now booting through RAM. 